Okay, we're doing a test here, folks. Uh, are you able to hear me on the studio now? Let me know in the chat room so that uh, I know that everything is working fine. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate it, guys. Not sure what was going on there. I had to reset the, uh, the studio for some reason to get it working. So I appreciate you all kind of uh, letting me know that everything is now working. So uh, miracles do happen, I guess. Anyway, I want to welcome everyone to the show. Sorry for the uh, technical difficulties there at the beginning. And uh, as always, I want to remind everyone that our show is brought to you by audible.com. And trust me, audible.com is not responsible for the technical difficulties. <laughs> That's all on blog talk. Nothing to do with audible.com. Uh, but audible.com, uh, for anyone who doesn't know, uh, is a place where you can uh, download audiobooks. And, uh, you know, instead of reading a book, you can listen to a book. And they got over 180,000 different titles to choose from. So I recommend y'all go and at least give them a check out, um, you know, test the site out, see if there's anything there you like. Uh, by doing so, they're going to give you a free audio book uh, for your visit, as well as a 30-day trial. Uh, and the way you do that is go to audibletrial.com forward slash Sasquatch Watch Radio. Again, that's audibletrial.com forward slash Sasquatch Watch Radio. So yeah, if you have an opportunity, definitely check them out and uh, it won't be, uh, you won't be disappointed. Anyway, glad that everyone could join us tonight. Um, still waiting on our uh our prime rib eating co-host to show up. I don't see him in the in the room as of yet, so hopefully he will show up uh, momentarily. But anyway, uh, I would like to let everyone know that we do have a great, great guest that's coming on tonight. I'm sure that many of you uh, have heard of Ron Murphy. Um, Ron has been a Bigfoot investigator for two decades. Um, and not only has he researched in Pennsylvania, but he has actually delved into the world of cryptids all the way from Maine down to Florida. He's pretty much covered the East Coast. Uh, Ron has also investigated the Loch Ness Monster and the Gray Man in Scotland. He holds degrees in literature and history, and his recently published book, Unexplained Chestnut Ridge, explores the paranormal world of western Pennsylvania. And for anyone that's never been in the Chestnut Ridge of Pennsylvania, let me tell you, that is a very, very interesting place. Um, I've been there a few times and I've spent some time up there with the Pennsylvania Bigfoot Society. And uh, I'm telling you, it's, it's, it's actually a very interesting place. There's been lots of sightings in that area. Uh, you know, Pennsylvania as a whole is full of sightings, but Chestnut Ridge holds the, the biggest part of those sightings. So definitely a very interesting place to visit. So without further ado, and since we're still waiting on our prime rib eating co-host, we will go ahead and uh, welcome Ron Murphy to the show. Welcome to the show, Ron. How are you doing this evening? Oh, hold on just a minute, Ron. Okay, I'll try again, Ron. Can you hear us, Ron? Okay, I cannot hear Ron for some reason. Uh, let's see here. What's going on? Looks like they're having all types, all types of problems tonight. Let's see what we can figure out here. Well, 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 well. Okay. I apologize, folks. It's got nothing to do with our end here. Something's obviously going on with this studio tonight. Not sure exactly what it is. So let me try this again. Hmm. 
How about now, Ron? Can you hear me? I, I've been able to hear you clearly since you started talking. Okay, I can hear you plain and clear now. <laughs> perfect, perfect. We're cooking with gasoline now. Perfect. <laughs> I'll tell you what. Sometimes, sometimes this thing just, you know, the studio's like got, got issues, you know. You never know if it's going to be a good day or a bad day. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, there's gremlins in the works, I guess. Uh, yeah, it, there's definitely something in the works, that's for sure. <laughs> you know what? We're so. having electrical storms up here in western Pennsylvania, <laughs> so I thought it might have been on my side, so I'm glad to hear everything's up and running. Uh, yeah, well, I guess it's a plus that I was able to finally talk to you. Uh, I just Absolutely. got a message. I just got a message from my co-host, and he says that the number to call in is not even working. So he's he's <laughs> he's, try, he's trying to get in too. So <laughs> unbelievable. Oh well, maybe he'll eventually get in here. Uh, yeah, we'll make it work. We'll make it work, Billy. Yeah, yeah, we'll we'll figure out something. So Ron, you know, it's been a long, long time. Uh, I'm very interested to see that you've you've written that new book about the Chestnut Ridge, which is a very interesting area. So I uh, I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. Um, what uh, what what urged you to uh, write that book? Just all the investigations you've done up that way. Well, actually, I was born in Blairsville, Pennsylvania, which is like right at the foot of the Chestnut Ridge. So mm -hmm. all my life. I've been, you know, gravitating towards this beautiful area of Western Pennsylvania. But uh, what happened was in the uh, early 1970s, we had this explosion of Bigfoot encounters. People were seeing this big hairy beast all over the place. And uh, my mother and I, we would watch the television. And as soon as they said about, you know, a Bigfoot sighting, or if it was in the local paper about a Bigfoot sighting, my mother would load my brother and I up into the old Buick. And we go out on the back roads of the Chestnut Ridge looking for them. So uh, I grew up with a mother that had a keen interest in the world of the paranormal uh, before, you know, anybody else was really doing any kind of serious investigation. So I owe it all to my mother and just for my proximity to Chestnut Ridge that really made me fall in love with this area. That's great. That's great. I think we finally have our prime eating co-host Creature Seeker with us. How are you doing tonight, Bruce? <laughs> Are you there, Bruce? Hear me? Now I hear you. Hey, Billy, the, something uh, something is really hanky with that number. I've been trying to call <laughs> in for like the last 10 minutes. Well, just, just to give everybody an update here, um, you know, anytime Blog Talk decides to do some type of an update, because I opened up the studio tonight and saw two new buttons at the top <laughs> every single time something like that happens or some kind of problem you, you know what sometimes you just leave well enough alone <laughs> uh, you know that's like that's like a windows 8 update or a windows 7 update yeah every time every time they do it something happens yeah it's uh, just buffering it's just buffering <laughs> so, Billy, am I to assume that they updated the, the, the switchboard? They did. They updated the switchboard, and they now have added a button at the top that's called Invite Guest and Co-Host. So now I can <laughs> click on that button. I can click on that button and send people a link by email so that they can talk on here via Skype. Oh, very nice. Very nice. <laughs> so that's probably their preferred method, which is probably why the phone number's not working. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, it's kind of uh, weird, they must have upgraded the switchboard to like, you know, switchboard millennium or something like that. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think it's just because we had Ron Murphy on the night. That's what it was. It blew I, up the studio. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, Ron. Welcome to the hey, show. <laughs> hey, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. I guess you're out there eating that prime rib according to Billy there, so I'm glad you're able to make it on. <laughs> you, you know, Billy, why did he, why did he always have to bring that up? I, I did have prime well, rib last. I'm sure you did. You probably had it all four or five nights that you was uh, camping out. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Billy, I only had it two nights. The rest of the nights were during oh. Oh, okay. 
Okay. Uh, <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, I swear. You know what? I I, I finally saw that uh, that Jurassic World. Have you seen What'd it you yet? think? No, I haven't seen I, it. What, you know what? I thought it was. I thought it was uh, very entertaining. Um, I thought it was probably the second best one in the series. You know, the first is probably the best, and this is probably the second best. What do you have? You seen it, Ron? I have not seen it. No, I have not seen it. Yeah, I well, see. I I was going to go see it, but I was reading the reviews, and everybody was saying that it's it's too predictable, and they were just saying that they just can't outdo the first one. So I, you know, <laughs> my um, problem with it is, is, is I don't want to see a pretty boy with trained velociraptors. Is that too much to ask? <laughs> <laughs> I, I would I would like to see the Velociraptors tear the guy to pieces, and then I would have been there day one. <laughs> well, you know what? It's just, I, I read some reviews, and some of the critics really panned it because they said that you know the the characters were very stereotypical. So, for example, the leading the leading woman in that movie, she she's portrayed the character is portrayed as like high maintenance, and you know yeah. she's really given the, the hero like uh you know uh, 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 an attitude at the beginning of the movie and uh you know you know my, my feeling billy is that look the movie's about scientists who bring dinosaurs back to life and exhibit them on this island like in a zoo okay um uh, right. the the fact that the leading you know the leading lady was a little bitchy was probably the most believable part of the movie so <laughs> <laughs> you gotta have, you gotta have some realism, right? Otherwise, yeah, it's totally yeah. unbelievable. You know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but yeah, it's uh, the movie actually it does have some twists and turns. So if you haven't seen it, it is, you know, it will keep you entertained. Yeah. Yeah, I I might end up going to seeing it. I, you know, it's uh. Me and Janine went and actually saw that movie Max. Have y'all seen that? I've not seen that. Max? Yeah, Max. No, just Max. It's about it's about a marine, you know, military marine dog. And military I'm telling you, dog. dog. Oh, dog. Oh, yes, yes. Right, right. That's a that, that is a at the first fifteen minutes is a tearjerker. Let me tell you. That is a that is a really great movie, and really shows uh, you know because those dogs go through a lot. Um, yeah, you know they're so, they're soldiers, and uh, it's it's pretty it's pretty sad. That first fifteen minutes will kill you. <laughs> Billy, when you said you saw them this be about Max, I thought you were talking Big Max. No, 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 no. I don't eat them things. <laughs> those things, those things that kill you, they'll kill you. That's, that's you know. Not true, Billy. <laughs> if, if the Big Mac kill you, I shouldn't be walking right now. <laughs> oh man! So, um, so Ron, you, you, the, when will the book be available? The book is available now. It's been out since oh. April. Oh, it has. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes, it has. Okay. Now, where, where's our, the best? Where's the best? Amazon.com. Ble- Amazon. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, because I uh, we put it up on the show page. That way everybody can look it up. So if you look up Unexplained Chestnut Ridge, I'm sure it'll pull it right up on the Amazon. Uh, I, for I, I checked the day before I came on, and it most certainly does. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. And it's only 10 uh, bucks. <laughs> hey, sounds like a deal. There's that's that's, that's, that, that's, that's, less, that's less money than Bruce spends at the Dairy Queen. <laughs> well, there you go. You yeah. well, know that I get we get emails from people all over the world who just bust my chops about the Prime Rib and Dairy Queen. Uh, thanks to Billy who keeps bringing it up on every show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, gotta have some fun with you, Bruce. Well, Billy, you know, you know, I, I don't know what to say. It was before. It was just a private joke. Now, 
it's shared with a, you know with like fifty thousand listeners. So I, I don't. <laughs> well, well. Anyway, I, Ron. Just so you know, um, uh, Brian Seach, our good friend Brian Seach, uh, had 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 told us that you know you need to get in touch with Ron Murphy. And you know, you know what's weird is I, I go through, I'll go through like my Facebook page, and I'll look and I'll say, you know, who have I not had on yet? And you know, I don't know what it is. I kept. It's like I, I couldn't. I never saw you on my Facebook page. I was like, shoot, I forgot all about Ron Murphy. <laughs> well, I don't think we That's, ever had you on. No, no, this might. You know, I'm flattered to be here, guys. So you know, even if it's a little bit late, that's fantastic. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, it's uh, but I felt bad because you're you're kind of local. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean you're, like, you're just one state up. So. <laughs> Yeah, that's but, right. Uh, so yeah, but hey, I'm, like I said, I'm glad I'm here, and I'm glad everything's working. So now, since since the first time we've had you on, um, everybody everybody likes to know, Ron, have you ever had a sighting? I have not ever had a sighting. No, I have not. Um, but what keeps me going is that uh, so many other people have had sightings. That's what keeps I think all this going. If, if, if there's an investigator out there who has never had any kind of eyewitness sightings themselves. What keeps us going is so many reliable first-person accounts of, you know, normal, everyday people seeing something lurking in the woods that they cannot explain. Yep. And that's why I'm here. Now, I have heard vocalizations before, um, but much later, uh, not even earlier whenever I started my research. Uh, this is only in the – I was actually with Brian Seach, as a matter of fact, uh, investigating in the Livermore area of western Pennsylvania whenever we heard um, uh, one uh, vocalization, which was absolutely amazing. Um, and uh, on two different occasions, uh, I was out uh, hiking with my family, uh, and one time my son had a rock thrown at him, and another time uh, my wife had a uh, stick thrown at her So uh, by some sort of unseen uh, – presence in the woods so not uh actually seeing something but i've heard something and i've actually had uh you know something tossed at us so uh it's enough to make me uh, believe there's something going on out there. now have you ever have you ever interviewed a witness that just you know i I'm, I'm sure just like the rest of us if you've interviewed a witness you you get some that it's like yeah you know it's not you think maybe they misidentified or something. Have you ever had that witness, someone that you talked to that just made your hair stand up on your arms and your, you yeah, know, yeah, that I, I, that's, feel? That's an, that's, yeah, that's an excellent question because I think that whenever I interview somebody, I would think about 50% of the people that I interview uh, are either a misidentification or are just completely pulling your leg. Um, and I, I don't think, I mean, there, there are, is a small percentage of people out there that hoax something just to get their name in a book or to get their name, you know, on television or something. But then there's a legitimate uh, portion of people that, um, you know, just something's off in their mind and they're, they're thinking they're seeing something. But, uh, yeah, I would say 50% of the people that I interview is either uh, a misidentification or a complete and utter hoax. Uh, and it's that other 50% that uh, is, you know, these people are, are looking at you. Sometimes they tear up, you know, sometimes they're, you know, they don't even, they're even afraid to make eye contact because the experience they had struck them so, uh, so to the core that they have no idea how to rationalize this in their mind. And these are the people that I am uh, most interested in. And some of these people that really have had uh, unique encounters uh, these are the people that are, 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 are very difficult to get a hold of because a lot of them won't even uh, talk about these experiences. Yeah. Uh, now, Bruce, do you got any questions? Well, I, you know, I'm just wondering if he's ever done any sense of research in the Clearfield County area. You know, oh, it's interesting. Um, the, uh, the only time that I've ever shot a deer was in Clearfield County. I went with a, a friend of the family. He said, you come on, you got to go hunting. Uh, I'm not much of a hunter or anything like that, but I, he took me to a place in Clearfield County and set me up on a tree stand. 
Um, and I heard when I was on that tree stand right before dawn what sounded like somebody whistling. Now, we were on acres of, of land and everything, but I have never investigated up there. I know that things are strange up in Clearfield County. This is beyond the realm of the Chestnut Ridges influence, of course. But uh, I'll tell you what, this is one of those unique places in, uh, in Pennsylvania where, you know, there, that's a book in and of itself. It, uh, I've, I've heard one whistle up in Clearfield County. I, I have no idea what it is. But, uh, yeah, I mean, that is, that is a strange area. And there's a lot of businesses up there capitalizing on this, uh, this Bigfoot uh, phenomenon. A lot of places are, you know, putting out uh, – uh, a signage with Bigfoot on and selling T-shirts and stuff. So uh, that's becoming quite a commodity up in the Clearfield County area. Well, I've been to Clearfield County on a number of occasions, and I will tell you, big goose egg up there. Uh, <laughs> people, <laughs> people labor under the assumption that there's some Bigfoot activity up there, but I don't <laughs> Every time, yes. every time Bruce goes up there, he gets disappointed. <laughs> is that, well, you know, and the thing is, most of the time that I go off, too, I'm disappointed as well, too, because every time I step foot in the woods, I expect that this will be the day that I see something. There will be no questions asked. Um, but every time I go out, I never have, uh, have that uh, encounter. And maybe the reason why is because the powers that be – want me to keep on going out in the woods. Anytime I get out in the woods is better than any day at work. So, you know, I'll go out in the woods and not see something every time, and I'll still love it. Well, Ron, I, I love being in the woods, and I love camping. But there are certain people out there who shall remain nameless who always say, oh, oh, we got to go to Clearfield County, uh, you know, Clearfield County, and that's a hot spot. Yes. And... <laughs> So we go, and it's like the most boringest thing. So I've been out like hundreds of times, and nothing's happened. But I usually go out, you know, with the understanding that a very slim chance that you're going to have any activity. With Clearfield County, it's pretty much certain that you're not going to have any activity. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, and I, I will definitely 100% take your word on that. Now, I'm always leery of an area that um, – that uh, sells T-shirts or, or posters or bumper stickers, because what's going on is somebody has capitalized on the idea that something is there, and uh, that's that's occurring more and more now. Thank the good word, the Chestnut Ridge is still pretty pretty virgin territory in that regard. Nobody has really built up anything along that area. It's still uh, a conservancy corridor. It's still a water protected woodlands there. Um, but, yeah, whenever you, you go into a place and they have, like, a Bigfoot pizza on the menu or there's a Sasquatch uh, cu cardboard cutout holding a sign that, you know, says two-for-one beers or whatever, uh, you have to question what the motivation is behind uh, people that uh, put these kind of things out there. So, again, I'll take your word for it. There's really no reason for me to go up to Clearfield County. So by you telling me not to go up there, I will definitely take your word on that. Well, Ron, I really think, I really think that the good folks of Clearfield County should go in the opposite direction with their promotion. They, sh they should actually promote it as, look, we are a Bigfoot free zone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. if, if you want to camp here and wake up the next day in your sleeping bag in the tent you started out in, come camping up here. That's a great marketing thing. I think that you should actually apply to the uh, uh, Clearfield County um, Tourist Bureau, and I think you would have a great bumper sticker. Come to Clearfield County. There's no Bigfoot here. That's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, that's, that's a great marketing aspect. That's correct. I'll, I'll tell you what, that's going to work for me. <laughs> All right, I'll work on the T-shirts. <laughs> so, uh, the T-shirts will say Clearfield County. And there'll be a, a, a Bigfoot picture with a circle and a flash through it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think a lot of Bigfoot investigators, especially in Pennsylvania, uh, whenever they go to a, a supposed hotspot, um, that's because they either have a buddy there or they, they have a bar there or they have a lady on the side there. That's usually what's going on when people repeatedly go to a particular area that is getting no hits whatsoever. Because if you continue to go back to an area and nothing is happening to, to not only 
your investigations, but on multiple investigations. Um, and, and that's not to say that something doesn't migrate through that area. That's not to say that there is something in that area every now and then. But if you're going to inundate an area with researchers and nothing is going on in that area, that's a complete waste of manpower, in, in my opinion. I agree. But you know the way it is, Ron. It's with some of these researchers, it's like Hope Springs Eternal. Oh, you know, it's it's almost like waiting in, in the pumpkin patch for the great pumpkin to appear. <laughs> you know what I mean? That, that is true. Um, the reason that I'm so fascinated with the Chestnut Ridge is because we are talking about a 70-mile uh, a spine of the Appalachian, you know. So there is a lot of area to cover here. So um, whenever I talk about the Chestnut Ridge, we are, we are covering, you know, western Pennsylvania on into outside of Morgantown, West Virginia. So this is a huge swath. So whenever we're talking about, like, a region, as opposed to a county, that you are dealing with uh, people that are, are are wishfully hoping that something is going to rise out of the proverbial pumpkin patch and show themselves. But yes, I do understand that. Um, and that that is commonplace uh, in the world of uh, Bigfoot investigation for whatever reason. I've been doing this for about 20 years now, and uh, many times I have given up uh, investigating with groups because I've been so turned off by the way these groups practice. And it wasn't until I met Brian Seach and that whole gang up there uh, with, uh, you know, uh, with the QT that I actually uh, fell back in love with the whole idea of researching with people because, you know, these folks have no, no uh, preconceived notions going into something. They go out there, they're scientific investigators, you know, if, if they have a hypothesis and the hypothesis is tested. Um, and I do so love going out with these people. Uh, and uh, that has really re reinvigorated me. And it was thanks to these guys that I actually wrote the book on Explaining World of the Chestnut Ridge because I do uh, I do feel such an affinity. So, yeah, I, I do know what you're talking about. I've also been involved with other investigators that um, right now um, – the, the world of Western Pennsylvania is kind of uh, over canvassed by uh, Bigfoot researchers, by paranormal researchers, that a lot of witnesses don't want to come forward and talk to you because they think that you might have some sort of affiliation with groups that have, you know, left a previously bad taste in, in somebody's mouth. So, uh, I mean, that's one of the problems that we have when we deal with, with certain areas and especially when we're dealing with such a close-knit world of the paranormal researchers, that we have to almost um, uh, separate ourselves from other researchers because we don't want to be compared to them or be insinuated with them. So, uh, yeah, I, I take all that you're saying completely to heart, and I do understand exactly where you're coming from, my friend. Now, the only redeeming quality of the Chestnut Hill Ridge area is that in the little town of Jeanette, there's a there's a restaurant called Fitzgerald's, and they have a 32-ounce steak there, which I'm very fond of. But other than that, I, I won't make the trip out there um, because it's like a, what, 14? No, it's never, but probably about eight or nine hours from, from Boston. Oh, sure. Heck, yeah. I get, uh, even 10. I, I spent a lot of time up in Boston, as a matter of fact. And um, whenever it's not so bad getting to Pennsylvania from Boston. It's getting to this area of Pennsylvania from Boston. That's the problem. Yeah, plus, once you get up there, Ron, it's a lot of work to get up to that ridge. It is. It is. <laughs> and it, it plays havoc on your car. Uh, there's low clearances. There's only, uh, you know, one or two roads up and over that thing. Um, and when you pull off, you are pulling off literally to the side of the road. It's not like, you know, the Conservancy Commission has put in parking lots up there. This is pretty wild, protected area, and uh, this is all, you know, second, third growth forest up there, um, but they're doing a fantastic job of making it, uh, you know, come back to life, and, uh, you know, they, they've done such a great job up there that, um, yeah, I, I take exactly what you say to heart. Um, it is very hard to get to, and once you're there, it's even uh, more difficult to uh, maneuver with it. Yes, and there's snakes up there too. I don't do too well with snakes. There's a lot of uh, uh, rattlesnakes up there and a lot of copperheads as well. And uh, to do research up there in the summertime, first of all, trying to get through the, the brambles and trying to get through all the, the brush and everything is one difficulty. And then you have to run into those creepy, crawly things that I prefer to stay away from. 
So you'll catch me up there in like November up and through about uh, March, and that's about it for me on the Chestnut Ridge. Yeah, and they have a habit of they, they like to lie across the path that you're you're taking. That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> that could be very unhealthy for the unwary hiker. Uh, and that's right. And I've seen people going on Bigfoot investigations before, uh, looking like they're you know going out to play tennis. You know, they have you know the shorts on, and you know they have they have a little ankle socks and a, and a, and a thing of, uh, you know, their, their, their tennis shoes and everything. Um, and I don't think that people understand that, you know, a mile or two outside of a Walmart in certain areas of this country becomes very, very desolate. Um, even in, like, you know, you said about being up there in uh, Massachusetts. You cross the border up there into uh, New Hampshire, and, you know, that's like a different world. I mean, you, you leave the, the main road and you're in, you know, it's all backwoods up in that area. And then going up to Maine, which I, I love Maine, but, yeah, people don't really understand that there are so many wild pockets up uh, in the United States, and there's plenty of place for uh, anything to hide. So, uh, yeah, whenever you, you, you think that, you know, whenever you pull into the Chestnut Ridge area, it's going to be a nice little hike. But it's nothing like that. Whenever you get off the road, you're making your own paths. You know, you're 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 blazing your own trails, so to speak. So yeah, I, I do agree with what you're saying, my friend. Definitely. Now, now, Ron, what, what you know, what attracted you to this area? Is it just you know geographically convenient for you, or you know, are there any other parts of the U.S. that have intrigued you? Well, I, it, the, the first and foremost is because. Uh, just the proximity of where I grew up, you know. I knew all the legends from this area, so that was the main reason why I like to focus on the Chestnut Ridge, just very, very near to me. Um, now, uh, whenever I investigated in places along the eastern seaboard, now I'm looking at specifics then at this point, you know. Are these areas able to support, you know, uh, a large ape-like creature, um, there's a lot of reports down um, outside of Virginia Beach in the Fort Story area. You know, that's a, that's a military compound. And there was a lot of reports down there about, uh, about a decade ago of uh, something wandering around in that area. And, you know, you go into this area, you, you have to go through, you know, the whole little military concentric station and everything, and then you go in and you have lighthouses there. But if you walk away from the main trail, you are seeing protected woodlands, uh, deciduous forest, uh, almost a mangrove-type forest in some swampy areas. So there's plenty of places for this creature to 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 not only you know lurk and linger, but also to thrive. So in Maine, um, especially whenever I get up clear up into the down east area of Maine, uh, you could have you know you could have 1,500 of these suckers running around, and nobody would see these things because nobody lives there. Um, Maine is the least populated state uh, east of the Mississippi River, and it is also a huge state. Um, and it's a great area for uh, Sasquatch researchers, but not a lot of people are doing it because it is inaccessible. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I find you know there's pockets in Virginia, uh, and then Florida. As soon as you get to the Everglades with the whole chunk cape, um, immediately you you come to a realization: this place isn't really equipped for mammals. And if you are a mammal and you're going to fill this little niche, pretty well adapted to uh, living in a uh, semi-aquatic environment. And, you know, you find footprints in this area, you know, sometimes with web feet. You know, uh, so, some of these areas also that are very riparian, very uh, uh, water areas, you find, you know, three-toed aberrations of footprints. So it, it's very interesting that, you know, geographically speaking, that there is the same type of creature being reported they all have a different um, description to them. And uh, I find that kind of stuff completely, completely enthralling. Um, but uh, also, I, I do like to, you know, delve into other cryptids as well. So, uh, and one of my big interests uh, now is uh, the whole idea of the world of the fae, of fairy creatures. Uh, that, you know, we're, we're talking about straddling dimensions and uh, what it means to be, you know, uh, you know interdimensional or you know, so I, even in my book, I've actually even uh, delved into some research where, you know, people see Bigfoot at one moment and then it disappears. And, you know, that there might be a, a fairy element uh, associated with uh, this Bigfoot creature as well, too. So 
So all of my research that I've done, I am keeping an open mind. I don't want to say that this thing is a you know, completely a terrestrial animal or it's a completely interdimensional animal. I'm saying that you know, through all my research that I've been doing, people are continually saying that they're seeing the same thing again and again and again. And this is worthy of research. And uh, you know, I'm fortunate enough to be involved in research at this juncture because so many good people are getting involved in it right now. So I think this is almost like the golden age of, uh, of Bigfoot research right now with all the equipment that we have out there with all the good people that we have out there and the intelligent people that we have, um, I'm just very, very thankful to be involved in the Bigfoot research right today. Ron, do you know a, a gentleman, and I use that term loosely, by the name of Fred Saluga? <laughs> I do, my friend. I do know Fred Saluga. So Fred and I have this ongoing debate about interdimensional Bigfoot. Okay. Uh, so Fred believes that, you know, Bigfoot can travel interdimensionally, and, you know, of course, uh, I don't. But yeah, are you in that camp? Are you in the Fred Saluga camp? Um, I am in the open mind camp. And I will tell you this, because I I hope that this will, um, I, I will tell you this right now. I hope that if Bigfoot is ever discovered, it is a completely flesh and blood animal. That would be fantastic. Now, if, if I say that Bigfoot is interdimensional, I don't want people to think that it is itself traveling between dimensions. I'm saying that you know there might be slips in the, in the streams of of what's ever going on in places like you know um, uh, in places in Scotland or places on the Chestnut Ridge. These might be areas where you know every now and then the veil between one dimension and the other one becomes thin and some, you know, beings can pass through. So I'm not trying to suggest that if Bigfoot is from another dimension, that it is somehow manipulating the dimension and traveling at will. But, um, you know, it's very possible that, you know, that, that, that you and Fred are both correct. You know, this is a completely flesh and blood animal. It just lives in a different world outside of our own. And every now and then, through no fault of its own, is you know bleeds over into our, our own world, but um, ever since I was a kid, I've always wanted to think that there was big feet out there having baby big feet living you know in our backyard away from human sight, and uh, you know that's a very romantic notion. I will say that I am eighty percent sure that if a bigfoot exists, it is a terrestrial flesh and blood animal, and I have to go with. Unfortunately, I will have to say. And I'll have to agree, agree with Mr. Saluga that 20% possibility that if this Bigfoot exists, it might be a different type of entity than what we would call classify as uh, as flesh and blood. I'm sorry, guys. I, I hope I didn't leave anybody down. I hate to be uh, equivocating, but uh, that is my that, through my research. That's at least what I've discovered. I found a lot of people that you know has had very uh, endearing encounters, almost to, you know, to so to speak. You know, they grew up with a Bigfoot family in the backyard, you know, picking apples off the trees, and it seems to be very bucolic, and this was a very type of natural thing. And then I've also had, you know, discussed with people that, you know, glowing eyes and, and you know, uh, holding glowing spheres and, you know, this whole, you know, UFO uh, type of uh, connection to it. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, would, I would have to say that right now I'm going to be straddling the fence, but I'm leaning more towards the side of this thing being uh, – a terrestrial, you know, flesh and blood, hairy creature out there. But then there's something also is telling me that the research that I've done, it sometimes seems to act a little bit out of the ordinary as well. So, Rod, have you ever been a meteorologist? I'm sorry, sir. What was that? Have you ever been a meteorologist? Yeah, I, 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 I no. I'll, I'll just go and say no, no. Okay, because, you know, you kind of sound like uh you know, that you have that kind of training when you say, well, you know, the forecast is there's an 80% chance that Bigfoot's flesh and blood with a 20% chance that there's going to be some interdimensional activity. That's right. Well, because I've, I've never seen one, that's the thing. If I, if I would see one, um, then, then I probably still wouldn't be completely convinced about what's going on depending upon the, the encounter. Uh, but I think from, you know, a scientific perspective, that I am going to leave myself open to a multitude of hypotheses and test these hypotheses. Now, I think what's going on, that there is so much 
detection equipment out. Thing is somehow manifesting between dimensions. That this will be something that will be the ruled as as factual or or fictional fairly soon, because this is something that would have to be measured. Um, if something is, is going between this world and the next world, there has to be some sort of energy emitted. So I would take, you know, say within the, you know, the next decade, if there is an interdimensional Bigfoot out there, somebody is going to measure this happening someplace sometime, and then we'll know for sure. But I would say that in the next decade, if nothing occurs, you know, in, 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 in the realm of, uh, of measuring this type of thing, then we're going to have to think in the world that uh, you know, this is a uh, this is a, a regular honest good example of it. But yeah, I, I, I do see Fred's point of view. I truly do because what goes on in Western Pennsylvania, this is a strange, strange area. And what goes on in Western Pennsylvania is people are 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 seeing things and there are other strange occurrences going on with it. You know? uh, Bigfoot communicating telepathically, I've heard. Uh, Bigfoot seen with UFOs in UFOs sometimes. So, uh, as a researcher, if these people are not pulling your leg, I, I got to leave it open to a uh, possible, you know, possible idea that this might be one of those things that's uh, straddling the fine line between this world and, and another world. Well, Ron, so what experiences have you had that would make you lean toward the 20% Bigfoot is interdimensional theory? The, well, <laughs> nothing that I've had. <laughs> all, all the experiences that I've had uh, makes it seem like a very territorial animal that belonged in a particular area, you know. So I would say that all the, uh, uh, all the first-hand experiences that I've had is opposite of interdimensional. So... Sorry, Fred. If Fred's listening. I, I hate to tell you that, Fred. But yeah, but I'm just saying that that's me. Um, I, whenever I've had vocalizations or if I've had, um, you know, things throw something at me and the feeling of, you know, something following you until you're completely escorted out of the woods, these are actions not by uh, interdimensional creatures. These are actions by a creature that calls a certain area home. And it's acting within the confines and within the realm of believable animal behavior. Uh, but I also have never seen a UFO, and I've never seen a UFO uh, dropping off a Bigfoot or sucking one up. But, you know, if people are seeing this, um, then um, then it's worthy of investigation, too. So, yeah, what do we do about that, guys? I mean, that, that, that's the thing. As researchers, I think we have to keep an open mind, and if something is, is being reported that's happening out of the ordinary, how do we go about bumping those into our, our 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 dynamics of how we're going to name these creatures? What do you think we should do? I got a uh, a hey Bruce. Let me grab this real quick. Jeremy James has got a question for Ron. Uh, actually, it's a two part question. He okay. wants to know if you were to meet a Sasquatch, what kind of temperament would you want the creature to display towards you? And then the second part is what would you like or what would you like to experience in your encounter? Oh, very, very good question. Um, well, obviously, if I, if, if, if I witness a Sasquatch, I would hope that it would be non-adversarial. So let's just put that right out there. I'm hoping that, that if I do ever encounter one of these creatures, it's going to be one of those things where we, it's by happenstance, kind of like bump into each other, and it's like a, almost like a sizing up, gradually walk away, kind of like in the Freeman video that we see. You know, it, you know, if this is a true creature or not a true creature, but that kind of thing. You know, it, it kind of glances at you, uh, sizes up if there's any kind of threats going on, and then just leisurely moves around or moves away. Because in essence, whenever we would have a Bigfoot encounter. That is like meeting somebody in their living room. You know, they know this area. They know how to, you know, appear and disappear within the confines of this wilderness. And uh, so I would hope that if I would ever see a Sasquatch, it's one of uh, mutual respect and uh, that it's, you know, it would just simply move up. But um, also, uh, the second part of that question, I think that if anybody would see, um, see a Bigfoot, I think the immediate thing that is going to come to mind is, you know what? We are justified for being out in these woods and for 
people calling us, you know, the lunatic fringe and all that stuff and all these other kind of words that are bandied about. But it would be justification that all of our work has, uh, has had some merit. All right, very good. Uh, let's see here. Lori had a question also, and Lori wants to know if you could tell us about the gray man in Scotland. Actually, yes. You know, I was able to go to Scotland whenever I was in graduate school. I actually went over there as part of a, uh, a study. Uh, I was looking at, uh, at uh, Christianity development in, uh, in uh, England and Scotland during the Middle Ages. But, wink, wink, I was also able to do some of these great side trips while I was in Inverness. I was able to go, you know, on an organized Nessie expedition, which is fantastic. Um, I was also able to visit a couple of the museums, kind of like what's going up there in Clearfield. You know, it's very remarkable what's going on. But um, Scotland does a great job with, uh, with uh, Nessie because you go into the museums and they're very, very skeptical. I was completely surprised that they're saying, you know, there's probably nothing in this place. But, uh, you know, every now and then there's something strange going on, and sometimes we get a weird sonar. So they kind of leave it kind of uh, open-ended. But, uh, yeah, if you guys get a chance, I would go to both Nessie Museums up there and drum the rocket right outside of Inverness. Beautiful place. But, um, yeah, the Gray Man. So what, what happens is the Highlands reminds me very much of the Chestnut Ridge area. And it's, 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 it's interesting because, you know, the Chestnut Ridge is also called the Laurel Highlands because it does have this feel of, uh, of, uh, of Scotland to it. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, so the Highlands um, is remote. You can, there's one road in, uh, and then you just basically hike. Uh, and all over the place, there's missing persons, pictures tacked on the tree. So it is very inhospitable. Uh, there's, you know, there's a place to die everywhere there i mean there's there's gullies and there's 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 raging rivers that just come out of nowhere whenever it uh rains heavy enough but um the gray man is one of these creatures that uh that is situated uh on on one of the mountains and um again uh, going into the whole interdimensional aspect uh some people think that you know it, it's ghostly it appears and it reappears and, and sometimes it can take the shape of fog um, but in investigating uh, the gray man, I find it very curious that it keeps on uh, coming out with uh, with fog. There's this idea of materialization, dematerialization of fog. But whenever I look at the Scandinavian accounts of something like a grundle that came in with the fog, came in with the night, I am leading towards the notion that this gray man in Scotland is not, you know, it's not so much materializing and dematerializing the fog, it's actually using the fog to go about its own business. So uh, whenever I was studying the gray man and whenever I was in the places where the gray man was, you know, was seen and sighted, uh, we're talking about, you know, these, these, these are, are, are great uh, hills, you know, they, they're not mountains. In any stretch of the imagination because they're not, you know, close to a mile high. But you know, just little foothills compared to the mountains of the, world, the mountains of the world. But um, where the gray man is seen is almost like the same places where Bigfoot is seen in Western Pennsylvania, and the uh, the behavior of this creature is exactly the same. Um, it, it it comes and goes with the night. It likes to stay hidden in the fog, and uh, even though a lot of people do say that it is interdimensional or it's a spectral creature of some kind. Um, through my research, I have to tell you that it seems like it's moving as a very plausible uh, flesh and blood animal. So, hey, there's one for you again, then, my friend. <laughs> Did we lose Bruce? No, I'm here. I think. Oh, okay, good. Oh. He's there. But also, I thought he was going to follow up on that. Well, the thing about oh. Scotland, though, I, I'll tell you this so much. Uh, uh, there's a lot of ferry activity, though, still to this day. I remember being on um, uh, a bus uh, outside of Inverness, a, a public transportation bus, and um, one of the locals obviously could tell that I was an American, probably because I had a, a shirt on that said, I heart Scotland. And um, he leaned over to me, and he, and he looked out the window, and he said, that, fair, that, that hill there behind you, that's a ferry hill. So even to this day, 
there is still this um, this uh, local understanding that you know things outside of the ordinary still exist uh, with the ordinary. So again, we have this interdimensional element that uh, I think it depends upon what part of the world that we're talking about. If we would go to Nepal, uh, I think that they would see the Yeti as one of these creatures that straddle the world between the corporeal and the incorporeal. And um, the same way that's going on with the Gray Man in Scotland. And now I think what's going on in a lot of Bigfoot research, like Mr. Saluka is doing, that people are saying that you know these creatures seem to have a dualistic type of uh, of uh, you know makeup to them. So. So I think it depends upon it. It's a cultural thing, definitely. So whenever you're in the British Isles, anytime you're over there, even for Nessie research, you're always going to come to um, some sort of uh, reconciliation with the world of the fairy because that is so ingrained within the European imagination. Now, uh, are you a person who subscribes to any particular faith, uh, Ron, that, uh, that you delve into the spiritual aspect of, you know, the, the paranormal or, or Bigfoot when you when you do research? Well, I'll tell you what. I'm Roman Catholic. I have no Catholic guilt. I've been I'm a cradle Catholic, and I'm still Catholic to this day. Um, and um, I, I, you know, I, I don't have any roadblock up concerning my my uh, investigation of the paranormal. But I, that's a fantastic question. I really never... Um, uh, thought about it, but I'm sure subconsciously that I, whenever I do any kind of investigation, that it has to be a part of my uh, a part of my makeup, uh, just because it's the person I am, and I'm 46 years old, so it's really ingrained with who I am right now. But um, I never really thought about it very much, and that's interesting. I think because I am this kind of uh, dualistic nature, this kind of uh, uh, idea of the corporeal and the incorporeal, is much easier to uh to uh to delve into in my respect than some somebody that might or not have been raised Roman Catholic. That's a fantastic point and I think that's something that should be looked into. And I and I also find it interesting that a lot of Bigfoot researchers out there today are um are uh, of of the Mormon thing. Uh and that also is going to have uh preconceived notions built into their research as well too. So excellent, excellent question, my friend. But yeah, I, I think that it's going to have to come into play. Whenever I am investigating, I don't go out there uh, with any thought in my mind, but I'm sure that it does come into play. So, uh, yeah, I, I would think that would have some ability. Well, just because I tend, to, uh, I tend to think that researchers who are heavily into their faith, sort of the research is, is, a, is I don't want to say the perspective that they come in at it from. When you talk to them, uh, and you have a discussion about it, you know, in depth. You, you sort of get the feeling that, you know, they're coming from they're coming from that angle as they're researching. Uh, and I noticed that, for example, if you talk to a tribal member and you interview them, they're very open to the idea that there is the spiritual aspect of Bigfoot. Uh, if you talk to someone who is uh, you know, a very uh, religious, you know, like, you know, say they're uh, Christian, they come into it from a Christian background and a Christian perspective on it. Mm -hmm. uh, I've even had, you know, uh, people say they thought that, you know, some, some Bigfoots were demons. Yes, yes, so, I've heard that as well, too, yes. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I was just wondering, you know, if you were coming from it from any any particular perspective, well, I'll tell you, um, I, I've heard, I, I've actually spoken to people before that thinks that uh, that seeing a Bigfoot is uh, is some sort of omen of an approaching apocalypse. Now, I've never went to that degree at all. And I've never seen Bigfoot as relating any way to, uh, to my particular religion. Now, um, whenever you examine some religions, you know, like Zoroastrianism, whenever you definitely have, uh, this differentiation between one element to another, then I could see this coming into play. But, uh, yeah, you know, I have, I have actually spoken to people that have, you know, without a doubt, this is a religious experience, uh, usually negative. This is usually, like you said, a demon 
or some sort of harbinger of the Antichrist. But uh, as far as I, uh, I'm concerned, that, you know, there's no, if there's multiple dimensions that uh, takes nothing away from my, uh, my, uh, my faith whatsoever. I'm completely open-minded enough for that. Um, but, uh, but if it's a flesh and blood animal too, well, that's just, you know, an, a, another part of, you know, creation or you know, whatever you would want to call it. So, uh, yeah, I, I've never seen Bigfoot through the lens of religion, although a lot of people do. Uh, okay. I was just, I mean, I was just curious, uh, I don't know, that was a great question. Oh, most certainly because whenever you deal, like especially if you would deal with somebody that you know was was pagan, and I don't like to use that word, word because that's kind of like you know a catch-all. But you know, if you talk to someone that has you know a Teutonic faith uh, tradition, um, then you know you're talking about these are elements of some sort of primordial world. You know, and it's you know mm-hmm. it's showing itself to them as some sort of either a totem or taboo. Also, almost like in the uh, you know the traditional Native American uh, situation, but I do not know enough of those faiths to want to rule on it on either side. I just know that the Native Americans have you know they have such a wealth of uh, of, of of a belief system in this creature um, that seems to also be very um, uh, either terrestrial or you know interdimensional or whatever whatever kind of catch words that you're going to use. But uh, again, this is part of their their faith belief system, and uh, so you know, just, it doesn't necessarily make it one way or the other. Because I know certainly, like when it comes to researching paranormal phenomena, that your your background certainly has an impact on the perspective of your research. You know, sure. so for example, there are people who I know who are, you know, really into their faith, and they say, "Look, don't." Ghost, they're demons. I'm not going to touch that with a ten foot pole. And I mean, Billy, you and you are reluctant to to deal with that stuff, right? Oh yeah, yeah. It, it's it, you know, and it's interesting that you kind of brought all this up, Bruce, because I didn't know if anybody's seen it. I don't know if she, I don't know if it was posted in the uh, chat room or not. But Ramble One just sent me an article, um, and it's from a, it's a, it's from a website called Mystics of the Church. And it's the first time I ever read this article, um, so I'm glad that they sent it to me. But there's there's a section in here where it talks about the demons' apparitions under different forms and what they mean. One of them is a black ape or hairy man. And it says that it symbolizes Satan's mockery of Jesus, for he is really the ape of God. I, this, is a, this is the first time I've ever read this. <laughs> Uh, and here's, here's another one. It talks about black human shaped shadow people, uh, talking about how quite, you know, they're quite common and they're demons in raw form. Their purpose seems to be to terrorize and scare, hoping to lead the victim to despair. And then another one that we hear about in some encounter stories is fiery red glowing eyes. That's right. Um, right. you know, so it's kind of interesting, you know, that, uh, you know, some of this stuff and, and, and Bruce, you know, you and I have talked about this, and, you know, and we've talked about, we know a couple people who have quit researching because of their strong belief that they were on to something. Mm-hmm. Well, so, if they were on to something though, I would think that that would be an impetus to continue. Yeah, I think, well, I think the, 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 the particular people were like, you know what, you know, they, they felt so strongly that they were researching something that was demonic that they thought that it would be in their best interest to stop. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> you know, like, well, I, yeah, I, I do. And you know what? If, if there was, like, in my book, I, I write more than just on, on Bigfoot. I also cover uh, the ghost of the Chestnut Ridge because uh, there's also this very long tradition of shadow people in and around the Chestnut Ridge as well, too. Um, and uh, so if Somebody would say, like, the house is haunted by a demon. I'm not going to go in there. You know, that's just me. I, 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 you know, I, I would have no way of dealing with anything like that. But, you know, in the research that I've done, um, I, I, I've not been frightened by it at all. Now, whenever, again, talking about this whole idea of uh, interdimensional, 
uh, the, the, the red glowing eyes is one of those things that gives me pause because, you know, nowhere in the animal kingdom, when we're talking about a mammal, do we have bioluminescence within the eyes. So, you know, if this is going on, then this is either uh, an evolutionary adaptation that is only known in this one particular mammal or something else is going on, you know. What I have proposed in my book is that um, whenever we see the red glowing eyes, this might not be actually a physical manifestation, um, especially if there is something like infrasound used. There might be a way for a very terrestrial flesh and blood creature to impact on you through, you know, infrasound or through through whatever true bioacoustics you know, to influence on how you're seeing it. So, like, one person that might be open to the idea of a demon, you know, he already has a preconceived notion, and somehow this creature through, um, you know, a territorial uh, display can produce some sort of infrasound that makes the person, um, you know, see it in a way that another person wouldn't see it. If that makes any sense to you, it's almost like um, that this animal can um, influence the Cartesian theater within you, that, that, that it's able to project onto your mind something that it wants you to see. Now, nothing to the strict uh, nomenclature of like, psychic influence. I'm talking about, you know, like an elephant, for instance. There was a uh, study done by MSNBC about um, of the infrasound of, of an elephant, one of these low-range frequencies. And it was interesting in the report that uh, it stated that one of the aspects of this is the filling of the paranormal. So if an animal, you know, like an elephant or, or alligators, if, you know, if, if uh, there's a Sasquatch out there and it is able to use uh, bioacoustics, it might influence, you know, you know, it could influence me to run. It could influence, you know, somebody else to sit and cry or whatever. But it also could influence somebody that was, of, you know, had some sort of preconceived notion of what it is to just bring to mind, hey, I'm seeing a, 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 a black creature with red glowing eyes. That's an interesting thing to consider, that this creature itself is influencing its environment through, you know, whatever natural resources it has. So yeah, definitely, just definitely. that when we encounter any phenomena or any creatures that are new, that there's always that element, there's always that sort of uh, religious or spiritual element that that people, in, you know, put on these events or these creatures that make them sort of larger than life, that mm -hmm. they have these supernatural powers or abilities. Uh, I mean, isn't that just normal for human beings to do that? And then we find out that, you know, there is actually a, a uh, physics behind it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's right. And, and, and if, there is, if there is a bipedal creature out there uh, that has adapted the, you know, bioluminescence to have, uh, to have red glowing eyes, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think Matt Moneymaker actually proposed that, 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 that this creature is able to do that. Uh, without any other precedent in the uh, in the mammalian world, um, I, I would have to ask myself why that is. And if that is happening, then it, it you know yeah, scientific research is necessity in that regard. Mm -hmm. that's yeah, that's always that's always been a very interesting topic. Uh, the whole infrasound theory. I mean, because it you know military's done testing on the infrasound, and infrasound has a lot of different you know, aspects and different things that it can do and cause people to, you know, people to feel, people to, to hear. Well, of course, you can't hear infrasound, but it can affect you in That's certain right. ways. Right. Military has done tons of testing on that stuff. And it, some of that stuff is scary. Oh, um, absolutely. Any, any type of mind control is definitely scary. Okay. But whenever you're, you're, you know, whenever you're talking about a Bigfoot or, or a creature of that, that, that idea, that I mean, this is great territorial uh, display. I mean, if, if you're going to stay hidden, 
if you have evolved simultaneously with other creatures, you know, human beings, you know, then in your main purpose to stay alive is to stay hidden, then of course you are going to start adapting to the environment. And if you do have the capabilities of producing infrasound, you know, just think about honing that over, you know, several millennia or whatever, you know, or, you, I mean, it, it's phenomenal to think that, you know, these howls that we hear, these chirps, these whoops, these can, you know, these might just be some of the vocalizations that we can hear with our ear, and we have no idea what might also be occurring underneath that we can hear. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Well, Ron, we've already burned up an hour. <laughs> I know. I'll tell you what. I had a fantastic time, guys. You guys have been have been so incredibly fun. I I, I hope we get to do this again sometime. Man, I tell you yeah, what, absolutely, Ron. I, I have to tell you, Ron, that that is probably one of the best comments me and Bruce have gotten in a long time. Usually, we get hate mail, and you know. <laughs> No, no, you got you guys deserve it. I'll tell you what, I've I've been fans uh, for for quite some time, and and I'm, you know, what what you guys are doing, providing a forum for for for, for researchers and for people that just have an open mind. I, I cannot applaud you guys enough. So thank you very much. Well, well we Ron, appreciate that's it. the first that's the first time anyone ever claimed I had an open mind. Usually, my mind has been described as like a clam at low tide. No, 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 no. You, you know, uh, I love Fred Saluga. I'll tell you this. I love Fred Saluga. I'll tell you right now. But, um, yeah, sure. Sometimes the things he says are a little bit hard to take as well, too. So for you all to listen to me to say that I agree with him 20% of the time, that's open-minded enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, Ron, 20% uh, of the time, that's like borderline, uh, you could be put in a jacket. That's right. <laughs> well, yeah, you know what? That's the Mendoza line for baseball. So if I do not hit higher than that, I'm going to be cut the next year. So, yes, I agree. <laughs> so, Ron, uh, before, you, before you go, can you tell us one last time how we can get your book. Well, it's available on Amazon.com right now. It's called The Unexplained World of the Chestnut Ridge. Um, and if anybody wants to contact me and, you know, chat with me or whatever, you can look up uh, Ronald L. Murphy Jr. on Facebook. Or you can also, my email is Ronald L. Murphy, J-R, at yahoo.com. Ronald L. Murphy, Jr., at yahoo.com. I'm looking forward to talking to anybody. I, I, I appreciate anybody that has any research, any kind of questions, any kind of suggestions. So, yeah, you know, feel free to, to get a hold of me any way you folks so desire. Sounds great. <laughs> we will definitely do that. And hopefully, hopefully, Ron, we can have you back uh in the soon future and, and get you on again because I know you got many, many more things you could talk to us about. Well, I appreciate it, guys. Thanks a lot. And anytime you need me at a moment's notice, I'll be there for either one of you. All right. Sounds All great. Right. Thanks, Ron. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Ron. Hey, thank Good you night. very much, guys. Bye bye. Bye bye. All right. I think we had some fun with, with Ron tonight. That was great. Yeah, Ron, uh, it's very, he's very, uh, engaging he, he definitely is and uh you know i learned i learned a few things tonight that's you know i learned that uh hey fred saluga might be on to something bruce and what are you gonna do i mean you know Billy, he's on to <laughs> fred saluga is on to something right and it's his medication all right <laughs> oh gosh we'll be glad fred you know, didn't call him you know, speaking of which, Billy, so Fred Saluga, so we had our we had our Creature Weekend camp out last week. Fred Saluga actually came down to the camp out. To did he really? Out. Yeah, he did. Came down, and so I was enjoying a very nice, relaxing day. It was, uh, I think it was Wednesday. It was really hot, beautiful blue skies. It was a perfect summer day. I was sitting out under the shade of this tree next to my tent. And I was like, ah, oh, this is great. You know, love being out with nature. Who pulls off Fred Saluga? <laughs> um, anyway, he, you know, he just has that knack, Billy, of just showing up and bursting your bubble. But uh, anyway, no, 
in all seriousness, though, so he, so I, I talked to Fred. He said he's coming down to camp out, and um, you know, he said, "Oh yeah, I'll be there at like at 9 a.m." and um, shows up like seven. Happened <laughs> at like seven a.m. in the morning. I went, and then he's like, oh, "Hey, I, I came over to your tent and I, I yelled, and you didn't get up." I'm like, "Fred, we were we were out squatching until like three thirty last night." You know, I I just got into some heavy rem. Oh, Bruce, uh, I don't know why you didn't get up. I was yelling at your tent. Uh, but so the whole day, uh, Billy, Fred, it was Fred and I. We uh, basically argued the whole day. <laughs> oh, man, that's just hilarious. I can imagine. <laughs> that's pretty funny because, so Billy, you know, he makes up words, right? So, you know, the app, the app where you can talk into your phone and ask it questions, it'll look up things on the internet for you and stuff. It's called Siri, <laughs> yeah. right? Exactly. Right. So he, calls it, he calls it Susie. So he's yelling into his phone, Susie, you big <laughs> You Bigfoot travel interdimensionally, you know. So, and then he just like random people will be out to lunch or something, and we'll be just walking out of the restaurant. He'll just walk up to a random table of people, and the first thing he'll ask them is, "Do you believe in UFOs or Bigfoot?" <laughs> I'm like Fred, just Fred, just stop it right now. And I'm like, let's go. He's like, and then for a point where he goes, "We're both researchers." I'm like, oh, I just felt like shrinking away. Yeah, he, that man has no shame, Billy. He really does. He really doesn't. <laughs> well, he's not afraid to ask the question. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, he's a good, good guy. One. He's a good guy. I really enjoy. It. Believe it or not, I do enjoy his company. We we always God have that. a good time. And he's, he's fun. But. Uh, He's got some. He, I mean, he's got some whoppers out there, Billy. You know, some, <laughs> some beliefs. <laughs> yeah, I do. I do. Um, he's something but so, while we're on the subject of the camp out, I just would like to thank everyone who made it out to the camp out last week. You, you know, it was. If you're there toward the beginning of it, the weather was actually not so bad. Uh, it did rain. We did get some decent rains there uh, toward the end of it, but. Uh, luckily, it didn't rain the whole time. You know, it would just thunderstorm, or whatever. Then it would stop. And that's good. You know, it wasn't it wasn't you know the the best weather, but we we had a great time, and it, it just lends testimony, you know, to the old adage that you bring you bring your fun with you, you know. Yep. And that's right. Everyone who came, everyone who came was in good spirits, and we just had a blast. We had lots of laughs, uh, and we had a we had a great little memorial for Melinda Thomas who passed away three weeks ago. She was uh, a volunteer for Creature Weekend. And uh, she, you know, was also like a, a into Bigfoot. And she lost her battle with cancer. So we had a little memorial for her, for those of uh, us who couldn't make it to our actual uh, funeral services. And it was really nice. Uh, we got to share some anecdotes uh, about Melinda and uh, many thanks to Linda Rio, who really put together a nice little, you know, photograph and memorial uh, for her, uh, for the services. And uh, it was really done very nicely. It was a, you were going to miss her, Billy. You know, yeah. Uh, she was just a great, great lady and great friend. Yep. So, uh, yes, yeah, it's... Uh... You know, it's 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 sad, and uh, you know, it's it, it's hard. You know, losing somebody yeah. that, uh, especially you know, Melinda. Melinda wasn't. You know, she was young. She's still young. Yeah. And uh, you know, it's just it's it's terrible to see a disease such as cancer take take folks because you know it's 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 disheartening to see. You know how that disease can actually, de you know, debilitate someone, and you know you want to help, but there's nothing you can do, you know, other than be a friend, and you know. That's right. You uh, know. Um, yeah. So it was bittersweet, but I think it was really nice that her friends remembered her. 
and I don't think we'll ever forget her. Her spirit will yeah. always be there at our events and our, our yep. camp. Um, yep. And I, I think about her. I think about her a lot, actually. Yeah. So, anyway, uh, you know, we are running way, way over our time. Yep. And, uh, yep. It was a great yeah, show. So. All right. Yep. Thanks, Bruce. I'm glad you finally was able to call in. <laughs> I know. It was really weird. I, I called I, in. I called in that number, and there was no ringing or anything. Yeah, I, I got to figure out what's going on. I, I need, you know, because you know we've had trouble the last few shows. We just need to, you know, figure out what's going on. So we'll we'll work on that. And uh, so basically, uh, you know. We'll see everybody. You know, we, we appreciate everyone coming on the show tonight. It was good to see everybody. Sorry about last week. It was kind of an unexpected thing. Uh, my my grandmother uh, passed away um, last week, and she was 93 years old. Um, she had Alzheimer's. She had dementia. Uh, so she, we don't know if she knew, you know, I had visited her, you know, a couple weekends before she had passed away. And, you know, we don't know. We don't, we don't know if she knew who we were or not. Uh, she had gotten to that point. And uh, we, we knew she wasn't going to last long because she had quit eating and quit drinking, um, you know, almost a week prior to her passing away. So, you know, all we can do is hope that she knew we were there and, uh, you know, so we got to see her before she passed, and then that's that's the reason we had to cancel last week's show because I was just didn't get back in town till till late Tuesday night. So, so again, you know, we uh, you know skip the show, but uh, we'll be back here next Tuesday night, nine p.m. Eastern. And uh, let's see. Yeah, we'll have a guest next week because the second Tuesday will be the following Tuesday, correct? Yeah, yeah. topic Tuesday will be not next Tuesday, but the following Tuesday. So, okay. All right. So we will see everyone next Tuesday night, 9 p.m. Eastern. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Thank you for listening to Sasquatch Watch Radio. We appreciate every one of our listeners. We hope you enjoyed our program. Don't forget 